Okay, we're covering the structure of matter. This is chapter two in Bouchong, and there's some objectives that you need to be able to answer. At the end of this PowerPoint, there's also some questions that you'll need to be able to answer and post on the discussion board for points. Uh, it'll count towards your workbook points. So, um, all matter described a combination of these four substances by ancient Greeks. Uh, Greeks, back, back when, um, before uh, BC, they're, they used to see that air, earth, water, and fire, and they viewed, you know, the four different elements here. So it's come a long way. So the Greek atom is the smallest part of the four substances of matter. This is what they thought. So 118 substances or elements have been identified. There's 92 that are naturally occurring and 26 artificially produced in high energy um, accelerators now. So we've come a long way from the four main things to 118 um, substances or elements. So um, yeah, we're growing, we're still learning. An atom is the smallest particle of matter that has properties of an element. So subatomic particles are particles that are much smaller than the atom. So when we talk about the Dalton atom, so John Dalton, he was a school teacher, um, he found elements that could be classified according to integral values of atomic mass. So elements were composed of identical atoms that reached the same way, uh, reacted the same way chemically. So physical combination of one type of atom with another was visualized as the eye and hook affair. So it's where they fit together. Um, the eye and the hook were different for each element. So uh, Dimitri here showed that if the elements were arranged in order of increasing atomic mass, a periodic uh, repetition of the similar uh, chemical properties occurred. He was the first to do a periodic table of elements, which is kind of cool. It was small, but still. So here was his um, periodic table of elements. And you can see now we have a much larger, we've divided it into metals, metalloids, and non-metals, as you can see here. So the Thompson atom, so J.J. Thompson, while working with the cathode ray, concluded electrons were part of all atoms. He described atoms um, look like plum pudding. So plums represented the negative uh, electrical charges, at, and the pudding was the shapeless mass of uniform positive electrification. So the number of electrons was equal in to positive electrification as it was neutral. So the electrons balanced out the, um, the negative with the positive. So Rutherford uh, disapproved of Thomson's model of the atom and introduced the nuclear model. So small, dense, positively charged center surrounded by negative cloud of electrons. So the center was the nucleus. So he, uh, Rutherford, is the guy that uh, pretty much has what we have today. So uh, Niels Bohr improved Rutherford's description of the atom, so he took it one step further. So he called it a miniature solar system. So the electrons uh, revolved about the nucleus in a prescribed orbit or energy levels. So they're small, dense, positively charged nucleus surrounded by negatively charged electrons that um, revolved in a fixed, well-defined orbit about the nucleus. So um, that's what we have today. Uh, new models are called quantum uh, cryodynamics, so QCD. And you can see here, this was the medieval atom. Uh, here you can see we had just air, fire, water, earth, and then the Dalton with the hook and eye. You can see the hook and eye there. The Thompson with the pudding with the little negative uh, floating electrons there, and then the Bohr model, which we use basically today. Okay, so uh, the fundamental atomic structure is the nucleus, which contains uh, protons, so gluons and quarks, and neutrons, which are gluon and quarks also. Then we have the electron shells um, with electrons floating about them. So you look here, in the middle here is your nucleus, and within each one we have a proton and a neutron, and we have quarks and gluons that kind of hold it all together. So protons have a mass of 1.673 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. They're positive, where neutrons have a mass of 1.675 uh, to the 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, and they're neutral. The electron has a mass of 9.109 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms, and they're negative. So what is the mass of a proton there? All right, so looking here. 
the atom, we have orbiting electrons. So we have in the center the nucleus, which contains protons and neutrons. And we have the um, orbital electrons floating out around. And the atomic number Z is the number of protons that identifies the element. In the nucleus, it contains um, particles called nucleons, so protons and neutrons. Both have 2,000 times the mass of an electron. Primary difference between a proton and neutron is electric charge. So the pro proton has one unit of positive charge. The neutron carries no charge, considered neutral. Remember, it's Jerry's jokes on that, so where the neutron is, you know, doesn't have to pay for his dinner. So I broke it down into a graph here from the book. Um, so the particle is an electron, it has shells, relative number one, here's the weight, the um, AMU, the number, the charge, and the symbol, and the proton is in the nucleus, and the relative number is 1836, whereas the neutron is 1838, and you've got the weight, the AMU, the number is one, you have a positive and a zero. So the nucleus is positive, contains protons and no neutrons, it's a large ball of uh, positive charge and it's very tightly bound. The number of protons defines what the element is. Generally more neutrons than uh, protons. So uh, when it's neutral the number of electrons equals the number of protons in the element. And when it's ionized is when the number of electrons does not equal the number of protons. could be more or it could be less. So with electrons, the arrangement of the electrons around the nucleus determines the manner in which the atom interacts. So the electrons are very small particles. They carry one unit of negative charge, and the mass, as we talked about, is 9.1 times 10 to 31st. So it revolves around the nucleus in fixed orbits, and the atomic mass of an electron is considered zero. But in reality, it's 0 0.000549, but they consider it zero. So the atom. Continuing on here, so we have um, electrons. Electrons orbit about the nucleus and are continually attracted to the positive force and repel of the centrical force. So they're pulled in and being pulled out as they make the turns uh, while they're orbiting. So the location of the electron is um, proballistic. Uh, you know where it is at all times. The electron travels at half the speed of light. Uh, if the nucleus was the size of a baseball, electrons would be a mile away. That gives you some perspective. So shells, um, more electrons can be held in shells further out from the nucleus. Outer shells can have a maximum of eight uh, electrons. So um, if we look here, a neutron, a neutral atom has the same number of electrons and protons, which we talked about. The number of protons determines the chemical element, which we talked about. And atoms that have the same number of protons but different number of neutrons are called isotopes. So make sure you remember that. And we're looking here at the electron shell. So you have the nucleus here, and this one would be K, L, M, N, and O, P, Q, all the way out. So the total number of electrons in the orbital shell is exactly equal to the number of protons in the nucleus. So closer to the nucleus, the greater the binding energy. So when we have ionization, so um, ionization, is, radiation is um, when electron is hit. The electron is knocked out of the orbit. The ion pair remains, so you have an atom with plus one and a free electron at negative one. Um, the difference in charge is equal to the difference between the numbers of electrons and protons. Um, always the electrons as protons are bound too tightly, wait, always electrons as the protons are bound too tightly, and the neutrons are neutral in charge. So it's always the electron that gets hit and knocked out. When we are looking at the maximum number of electrons per shell, so the maximum number um, of electrons is 2 to the n at the second power, so n is the shell number. So no outer shell can t contain more than 8 electrons. So the shell number n is the principal quantum number. So when we look here in shell 1, which is the K shell, you have maximum number of, um, number of electrons is 2, so heading down. So orbital, orbiting electrons, so transitional elements, um, atomic progression from smallest to largest atom is interrupted in the fourth period. So adding electrons go to the inner shells. Um, to where the outer shell, remember I said it can only handle eight, so it starts adding extra electrons to the inner shells. So um, 
centrifugal uh, force, so center seeking, uh, the force that keeps the electron in orbit. Um, it keeps the electrons flying in a circular or elliptical path around the nucleus. So it's constantly pulling them in. And you can see here, we've got the center, here's your nucleus, and here is your um, electron rotating around. So you can see it's being pulled and sucked back in by the force here. So um, it's always being pulled into the nucleon. So um, electrons revolve about the nucleus in fixed orbits or shells. Electrostatic attraction results in a specific electron path about the nucleus. So your electron binding energy is the strength of attachment of an electron to the nucleus. So it's designated by um, E to lowercase b, and that's your um, binding energy there. Closer to the electron um, is to the nucleus, the more tightly bound. So your K shell versus your M shell, your K shell is going to be tighter bound than it will be out. So K shells have a, uh, a highest bond following by L, M, etc. Not all K shell electrons have the same binding energy. That's something important. So the larger, more complex the atom, the higher the binding energy. So it takes more energy to ionize the atom in, um, than a small one. So if we're looking here, atomic configurations of approximate um, electron binding energies for three uh, radiologically important atoms. So as the atom gets bigger, electrons in the uh, given shell become more tightly bound. So to ionize tungsten through the removal of a K-shell electron, you'll need 69 keV, so kiloelectron volts, or it cannot be ionized. So here, if you're going to go for a K-shell, you got to be at least 69 keV in order to ionize tungsten. So uh, lead in the K-shell, the binding energy is 88. This becomes an issue with CT and PET. Um, lead shielding can generate secondary radiation with lower energy and deposits um, more dose within the patient. So atomic nomenclature. So when we look here at the chemical symbol, alphabetic uh, abbreviations of an element, the chemical properties of an element are determined by the number and arrangement of electrons. So the number of photons is the atomic number represented by Z. The number of photons <clears throat> plus the number of neutrons in the nucleus is called the atomic mass number symbolized by A, and it's always a whole number. The actual atomic mass of an, an atom is, the measurement, is a measurement and rarely a whole number. So you can see here we have the atomic mass is A, and we have the atomic number is Z, and the number of atoms or molecules, and then the variance stays at positive or negative there. So isotopes, atoms that have the same atomic number, but, um, but different atomic mass numbers are isotopes. They contain the number of protons, but varying number of neutrons. Isotopes just, uh, describe all atoms of given elements. So different nuclear configurations react the same chemically. To calculate the number of neutrons for an isotope, it's A minus Z. Isobar is um, the atomic nuclei that have the same atomic mass number but uh, different atomic numbers. So an isotone is atoms that have the same, same number of neutrons but different number of protons. And an isomer, um, they have the same atomic numbers and the same atomic mass. Combination of atoms, so you have molecules and compounds, so molecules, atoms of various elements may combine to form structures called molecules and compounds. A compound is any quantity of one type of molecule, so the smallest particle um, of an element is the atom. The smallest particle of a compound is a molecule, so that should help, help you understand that a little bit better. So radioactivity. Uh, atoms in an excited state with an unstable nucleus that release particles and energy spontaneously and transform itself into another atom to find stability. So radioactive uh, disintegration or radioactive decay, decal, I think that's supposed to be decay, <laughs> sorry. Um, Radionuclei are atoms are involved and the arrangement is called the nucleide. So radionuclides. They are atoms that start off with an excited, unbalanced nucleus. They get back to their natural state by emitting uh, energy and particles. The process is called radioactive decay. 
Radioisotopes can be made artificially with uh, cyclotrons. So PET isotopes are made this way. So when we do PET scans, that's where we're getting our isotopes. We manufacture them. The process is called radioactive decay. And what happens is there's beta and alpha emissions from that. So neutrons. When a nucleus contains too few or too many neutrons, the atom can uh, disintegrate radioactively. So it brings the number of protons and neutrons to the same for stability. Radioisotopes are produced in particle accelerators or nuclear reactors. So seven uh, radioisotopes of barium have been discovered um, artificially produced. So that's kind of crazy, huh? Naturally occurring, so uranium um, to radium to radon. So when it's decaying, it goes from uranium and then it decays to radium and it decays again to radon. So um, that's just the process. So in decay, so you have beta emissions and alpha emissions. And the posi uh, positron emissions is important for nuclear medicine. So we're going to discuss it. You need to know what it is. Um, if you're going to go into nuclear medicine, you'll really understand this. So beta emissions, so an electron, so with beta emissions, electron is created in the nucleus, um, in the nucleus is ejected from the nucleus and a high energy, with high energy and escapes the atom. So loss of a small quantity of mass and one unit of negative charge. So the neutron uh, undergoes conversion to a proton. The beta emission is increased the atomic number by one. The atomic mass number remains the same and changes one atom to another. So here you can see we have the beta coming off and it's going, it's changing the actual element here. So with alpha emissions, it's more of a violent process. The alpha particle consists of two protons, two neutrons bound together. So the atomic mass is four. Uh, the nucleus is extremely unstable uh, to emit an alpha particle. It loses two units of positive charge and four units of mass, so it changes itself chemically, and it's lighter by 4 AMU. So you can see here it changes to a different element with an alpha particle. So radioactive half-life. The half-life of a radioisotope is the same required. Uh, for the quantity of a radioactivity to be reduced to one half of its original value. So it takes 100% of the isotope and when it brings it down to half of its original value, that's your half value. So uh, radioisotopes disintegrate into stable isotopes, so they become different elements. Why they do that? They never reach zero and they're measured in becquerels. So what it is is one becquerel equals one disintegration, uh, disintegration of one atom each second. So just remember those are measured in becquerels. If we're looking here, so this is iodine-131, decays with a half-life of eight days. Um, they use this for scanning in nuclear medicine. So this linear graph shows the estimate of radioactivity only for a short period of time. So if you look at 100% here and you go to 50%, right on the 50% line, you can see it's about eight days. We're looking here, so this is a semi-log graph. Uh, used for estimating the radioactivity of iodine-131 at any given time. So you can look at how many days and how much it's decayed. So if you can do the 50%, so eight days, so it's about right there is 50%, and then it just co keeps continuing over um, for a long time. <laughs> so radioactivity after any period can be estimated uh, from the linear A, so the upper graph here, um, or the semi-log graph. So the original quantity is assigned a value of 100% and the time of decay is expressed in units of half-life. So how many half-lives um, do you have? So if you keep taking the, the value here, what the half-life is at 50%, and then you can figure out how many half-lives there are um, till the time period that you're looking at expires. So Radioactive decay, so activity remaining um, equals the original activity. So uh, that would be 0.5, so half to the nth power, n is the number of half-lives. So chemical bonds, we're going to shift a little bit here. So um, valence shell electrons control the electron negativity. So ionic bonds, transfer of electrons from a metal to a nonmetal in order uh, for both atoms to, to obtain a full 
valence shell, so opposites attract there. And with covalent bonds, sharing of electron pairs between atoms, most common between atoms with similar um, electronegativity, uh, similar groups work together. Opposites attract and groups that work together. So we're looking at uh, the types of ionizing radiation. We have particulate um, radiation, so that's alpha and beta, and we have electromagnetic, which is gamma, and x-rays. And we're looking here with the particulate, um, we're looking at alpha and beta, and we have alpha, beta, and there's beta, positive and negative. Um, the atomic mass of four for alpha, so they're big. That's a big thing. You can stop them with a piece of paper. Um, beta is 0, 0, and the charge for alpha is plus 2. The beta negative is negative 1, and the positive is positive 1, and they all originate in the nucleus. Where we're looking at electromagnetic, we're, we're talking gamma rays by the Y there, and X rays by the X, 0, 0, 0, 0. One is in the nucleus, member, and one is in the electron uh, cloud for X rays. So alpha and beta are associated with radioactive decay. So with the alpha particle is equivalent to helium nucleus, but has an AMU um, of four and carries two units of positive electrical charge. Only emits from heavy um, from heavy uh, from heavy elements. So alpha particles is large and exerts great electrostatic force due to the high velocity of the alpha particle. It, easily transfers kinetic energy to orbiting electrons of other atoms. So um, highly reactive um, alpha radiation particles possess a 4 to 7 um, mega electron volts of kinetic energy and ionized approximately 40,000 atoms every centimeter and it has a very short range. Where beta and the electron is emitted from the nucleus of a radioactive atom. The beta particles uh, transverse air, um, ionizing several hundred atoms per centimeter. Um, the range is longer than alpha because it's a smaller particle. So 10 through 100 centimeters of air and approximately 1 to 2 centimeters of tissue. So um, more so than the alpha particle. With the electromagnetic radiation, so X-rays and gamma rays are a form of electromagnetic ionizing radiation called photons. That's what we're used to studying. Photons have no mass and no charge. They travel at the speed of light and are considered energy disturbances in space. So the difference between beta particles and electrons is, um, is origin. So um, gamma rays are emitted from the nucleus and are associated with alpha or beta emissions where x-rays are produced outside the nucleus in the electron shells. So that's the difference there. Looking here, uh, the different types of radiation, um, ionizing radiation is, um, you can see here the alpha particle coming through to tissue. It ionizes a lot in, but can only travel a short distance because they're so large. And the beta particle will penetrate deeper where the x-ray can pass all the way through. So um, you can see here it says different types of radiation ionize matter with different degrees of efficiency. Alpha particles represent highly ionizing radiation with very short range in matter where beta particles do not ionize so readily and have a longer range where x-rays um, have low ionizing ionization rates and have a very long range. So these are the questions that are posted for the discussion board. So you're going to want to go ahead and make sure you answer these for me. And um, your discussion board posts are due Sunday, uh, next Sunday, so the 4th at 1159. You want to make sure you review for the quiz. You want to read Carlton and Bouchong. And next week we head into more physics. All right, good luck.